We're all solipsis in bumper cars, just like <laughs> solipsis in bumper cars. <laughs> yeah, just like trying to think about what other people's thoughts are. Yeah, and it's real. It's just something that literally no one has ever achieved. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Breaking Fast with Saint Sparkle Bear. I am Saint Sparkle Bear, and thank you so much for joining me at my table today. Today we sit down with artist and nature educator Jam Doty. Jam and I share veggie tacos replete with all the veg and plantains for dessert. Jam teaches the littlest humans at the Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago. We discuss how to teach empathy, living and creating with neurodivergence, and how being non-binary shaped their view of the world and their art. Jam's art plunges us into a state of magical realism where everything, whether animate or inanimate, is alive and pulsing with life. From a spiritual stance that can only be described as pragmatic animism, Jam reminds us that despite all of our complexity, culture, and ideology, that at the end of the day, human beings are just animals. Glorious animals living within and among a vast and mind-blowing ecosystem that we've only begun to understand. Grab a plate and pull up a chair. It is time to break fast with Saint Sparkle Bear. In my conversation with Jam today, we discuss the complex reality in which we live as human beings and how if we pay attention to that reality, we can live fuller, more authentic lives while also doing our part to save the planet. It reminded me of the writing of author Adrian Marie Brown, who is just awesome. And she wrote a book called Emergence Strategy. And in the introduction, she says this, Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. It is another way of speaking about the connective tissue of all that exists. The way, the Tao, the force, change, god, goddess, life, birds flocking, cells splitting, fungi whispering underground. Emergence emphasizes critical connections over critical mass, building authentic relationships, listening with all the senses of the body and the mind. With our human gift of reasoning, we have tried to control or overcome the emergent processes that are our own nature, the processes of the planet we live on, and the universe we call home. The result is crisis at every scale we are aware of, from our deepest inner moral sensibilities to the collective scale of climate and planetary health and beyond, to our species in relation to time and space. The crisis is everywhere, massive, 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 and we are so small. But emergence notices the way small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns that become ecosystems and societies. Emergence is our inheritance as part of this universe. It is how we change. Emergence strategy is how we intentionally change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. But yeah. Do you want to show everyone our benevolent god up here? That is our benevolent god of <laughs> our podcast. Marshall. It's a Pomeranian in a lawn. It's on a lawn and it's smiling. It's giving us full on smizing. He's very happy to be a Pomeranian. And he's, he's about actual size because really? he's a pretty large Pomeranian. Oh I got gosh. to meet him last week and he is an absolute chicken nugget. He's, he's a, chicken. a really sweet. <laughs> he's a chicken nugget. <laughs> He's a chicken nugget of a Pomeranian, yeah. <laughs> and he's looking after our podcast. Today. Yeah. I'm going to do official introductions. Will you say your name and your pronouns? Yes. I am Jam Doty, and I use they, them. Yes, you do. And I am Saint Sparkle Bear, and I also use they, them. Yo, every time you share your pronouns, you get to light it up. <laughs> <laughs> but only if you're a they, them. Because... <laughs> Sorry, everybody else. Oh, no. <laughs> Starting out with a, with a strong take. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, strong take on, on non binariness. <laughs> We're the coolest. <laughs> My most recent favorite, inarguable, but still still a point I care about point is all cars are bastards. All cars are bastards. 
Why do you have this perspective on life, Dan? Because they just, they, they, cars, they're bastards. Cars are bastards. <laughs> Is it, they'll get you, they'll yes. squish you. Yes. They'll they, fuck up how we plan literally our entire world. <laughs> our entire world. The entire <laughs> landscape of the United States has been shaped for cars. That being said, I'm really loving watching the Fast and Furious series. <laughs> simultaneous yes <laughs> yes multiple truths can exist at the same time so damn you grew up in washington where in washington i grew up in edmonds and it's like half an hour north of seattle okay and it's pretty close to puget sound i always lived within like a five minute drive of the beach now yeah now i've moved from a uh, tiny ocean to a huge lake yes <laughs> <laughs> which i think is really funny like you can see across puget sound you oh, can not see across lake michigan lake michigan no yeah no, and you can see across to the peninsula and the san juans which are fucking gorgeous are they why why tell me about uh well it's the rainforest <gasps> oh. and the san juans are just like little bumps of rock sticking out of the ocean covered in rainforests and like ravens and crazy mushrooms and shit. That sounds totally yeah. magical. Is that where you discovered Thai pools and interests in ecologies or in ecosystems? Yeah, I never really like took it seriously as something I could study until college because I was always really intimidated by science classes in, in elementary school, so I didn't really like pursue it. Why was it um, intimidating? I seriously think it's literally just because of the architecture of the lab classrooms. Everything in there echoes. Oh. And everyone has tall seats. So, like, if you're in there and with a room of teenagers, everyone's, yes. like, swinging their legs and, and, like, tapping really loud. And, like, it's just an echo chamber. And I literally can't focus in rooms like that. I right. just can't. No. Well, <laughs> and so I could yeah. never retain science. There was peer pressure. Like, I am a big question asker. I ask lots of questions. Yes. And, like, people would always be like, yeah, we just learned this down. Like, it showed up. Like, Stop asking. Stop we being all curious. understand. I don't know. Just the fact that people in the 90s also now don't really um, people forever don't really know how to deal with all uh, the people forever amen with yes. like sensory well with issues with, <laughs> yeah no with like neurodivergence yeah as it appears as it appears in particularly i think like with artists and people who collage and mash up a lot of different things there's something about frames yeah there's like a neurodivergence because it's like taking in so much information including all the information that doesn't need to be taken in so this difficulty processing stimulus you know, like do you have a positive side to that in terms of your life creativity sometimes that manifests as audio hallucinations which can be really Ooh. unpleasant Okay. Or they can be really nice. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they're cool. That's really like, cool. My brain really likes to make white noise into music. So like oh. while I was in the shower earlier, I was like, oh, who's rocking out? And then I realized it was the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I am jamming. This is a great song. That's so good. The dishwasher was making the good too. And in terms of on the bright side of how my brain worked in high school, yeah. it also made me a really good student. <laughs> Just right. not in the classroom. Like, For I sure. was unable to do anything in the classroom. Yeah. But yeah. I was really interested in everything I was learning. Well, because you were, like, actually very curious about the world. It was just that the world wasn't wasn't curious on how to have you included in it. Yeah. And you think it's a non-binary thing? I don't know. Because, I mean, I didn't know that was what was up in right. high school. Because I didn't know it was possible for that to be what was up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> how did this style of drawing develop? I stopped trying to control what I wanted my drawing style to look like and let it just do its thing. <laughs> okay. Because for a yeah. really long time, I was focusing on like trying to make things as like scientific as possible. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started doing botanical illustration, I was very focused on making things literally like a etched monograph that you could use to like phylogenically <laughs> like examine this plant and like yeah. that is a cool art it is cool art i just kind of started like i'd always kind of felt weird about art that i made that wasn't drawn from life yeah and i still struggle with that like the collage art is kind of a stepping stone so you were drawing was it oh, like yeah, you were I, drawing other people's art or you were drawing what you thought tell, what's, tell me more about that like no matter what style I tried to draw in or when I was trying to draw like realistic things, certain styles would always creep through. 
especially when I'm just trying to draw something straight out of my brain. Yeah. Like, if I'm not using any reference images, I notice, like, very particular trends in, like, how I drew. And for the longest time, mm -hmm. I was trying to break all of those. Yeah. And now I'm just kind of letting them exist as, like, a filter in my brain that I can run images through. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Because you have the ability to draw in ways that are not your natural drawing. Because you develop Kind those. of. <laughs> like, that's the thing is, like, the thing I draw still looks a little bit like my brain. Yeah. I, I think that's not even just me. Like, I get that feedback from other people as well. I, mm -hmm. can, I can tell this is your work. The work that I have of yours that's up on my wall is, like, it's, it's some of my favorite because it's so specific. You have that like, same quality. It's like a signature sort of. They're very, like, if I see your work... I know that it's you, and that's the yeah, same with. I used to think that was like like a like a telltale or like a yeah. slip up. I was like, no, I want my art to like actually have an it's, identity. <laughs> it's your voice. It's your voice. I don't want it to. I think also like I um, in high school and college, I spent a lot of time looking at crazy art on the internet, yeah. juxtaposed and like high yeah. fructose. Just spent so much time consuming all of this really crazy, intense, highly like professional. Yeah. Art. Yeah. And I just had it internalized that all of the markers that show that my art is mine also mark it as unprofessional. Because <laughs> I was like, none yeah. of my like my stuff looks like none of this. Like none. <laughs> right. And I thought that was a terrible thing. No. And now I'm like, that, that's a that's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like the fact that you are you're on your own path and you're doing your own thing and creating your own vision. It's totally amazing. It's been very hard to accept that without accepting artificial boundaries on what I can do. Just because all of my art is going to have this like distinctive, weird texture to it that yeah. is unique to things that I make, I can still like push myself to try and learn how to depict different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really want to figure out how to draw comics, how to draw humans doing different I mean, things. We've talked, we've talked about doing a comic together. Yeah. yeah. I like can't make predictable facial expressions. I just can't do it. It's when I draw a face, I'm like surprised yeah. at whatever face they are making. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at you! Like yeah, you're more I'm surprised like, than the fuck, surprise face. You were face. supposed to be happy and you're just like... <laughs> okay, so here's here's the thing that I see in your work and I'm kind of curious to hear more about it from you. There's, when I when I look at your work, it's very alive. When, you're, when you draw anything, regardless of it's an animate or inanimate object, there's, there's dynamism and there's form and there's all of this movement and there's like a vibrancy. And I'm curious, is that how you feel in your world? 100%. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you for phrasing it like that because yeah. that is super true about yeah. how my brain has been for my entire life. Okay. As, as a kid, I always had a really hard time understanding that inanimate objects did not, in fact, have feelings. Yeah. And, like, I've never truly believed it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you if you have a couch for a really long time and then you put it out in the alley, the couch is sad. Yeah, for this sure. This is just the truth. It is a sad and, like, couch. We've seen is, them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, that is, I mean, like, objects exist in time, just like everything else. And yeah. And they have history and yes. a life. They do. <laughs> they, no, they, they totally do. There's energy within everything because there's a story in it. Yeah. It, it had a beginning. It, it, have, it had a life, and it continues to have a life Yeah. as it's encountered by other humans. And disregarding the emotions of objects is an important part of consumerism. <laughs> disregarding the emotions of objects is an important part of consumerism. It's what, it makes it possible. It's one of the many things that makes... Uh, just like jabs this system into continuing to work. It does. <laughs> but it's yeah. very important. Like you need to not become attached to things and not yeah. value them and care for them in right. order to buy more of them. Correct, yeah. And <laughs> also like it encourages, um, it seems to encourage a lack of, of em empathy or presence in the world. Yeah. Because and like you, you would think to... that not caring about objects would be anti-consumerist. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's kind of both. <laughs> it, it's sort of it's, no, but I, I know what you mean because like there's something about caring about individual objects, individual objects like specific objects that mean something to you or that uh, that carry you. I have piece, like particularly for me, I know pieces of art that I just carry with me forever. Yeah, because they're so important. Hell yeah. Have you always seen the world that way? Yeah. Yeah. 
from when it was more pathological to now when it is more under control. <laughs> pathological. But the, That's a hard I, word to use, I mean, like, <laughs> it was getting in the way of my basic functioning as a human being when I was oh. an unmedicated child. For sure. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God. Because I was just so overwhelmed with emotion all the time about, yeah. like, what was happening. And not just, like, to objects, but, like, animals and stuff. Like, I just... Before, like, when I was a really little kid, I definitely, like, had hyper-empathy that was yeah. too much for me to handle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, it was very, it was, it was challenging. And, yeah. like, I still deal with that. Being hyper-empathetic or empathic or however you say it in a culture that encourages apathy and encourages the opposite is, is a very difficult position to be in. Yeah. Because like, you're, you're feeling like you're against the stream. Yeah, little things would just flip me up. Yeah. <laughs> Not even like a, I don't know, probably some of it was like a normal ass kid. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> All kids have wild brains. I wasn't diagnosed or medicated until fourth grade. They actually put me on a grown up medicine oh, that wow. I don't think children were supposed to take. <laughs> oh, and I was no. on it until I was 19. Wow. And okay. now I'm on a different. Because I'm on, I'm on, yeah, mm -hmm. meds are important for, they're, for they're different super brains. Important. They're yeah. super goddamn. Yeah, for neurodivergent people, I think it's it's important. To I make. need to learn how to grow Lexapro in my garden for the apocalypse. <laughs> 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 if anyone knows. Can we, like, get gene editing, like, right before everything goes yeah. to shit so I can just grow my meds? Or we could, like, or we could, like grow, like, serotonin in our tomatoes or something. Like, and so, like, we just eat the vegetables and they're You just have, like, a happiness marinara. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about how how you've taken all of that stuff that was difficult to manage. How have you kind of like started to to function with that or manage it? Smoking weed really helps. Smoking <laughs> weed, yes, it does. Not saying that smoking weed like makes me apathetic. No, no, no. But it definitely helps me not think about everything all at once. Yeah. Which was kind of my state of being before I figured out that this could help with that. Yeah. And you mentioned auditory. It's really hard to think about everything all at once. It is I know hard. everyone deals with that like to a yeah. degree. It's just I have found that to be helpful in being able to actually be present. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah, definitely. I'm hearing that your brain, like everything is alive and, and everything is part of uh, sort of the field of life. Yeah, and sometimes our brain kind of like stirs them together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, is that spiritual for you? Like, do you find that that makes you see the world differently? Like, your view of the world is almost mystical. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Like, like, is it spiritual? Is it? Well? Yeah. Tell me about how what you believe and how you believe and how that informs your art. Basically, what I believe is yeah. in literal biological reincarnation <laughs> so like we decompose yes we become parts of other organisms yes. that is fucking reincarnation that is reincarnation like, that's how i feel and, and that, yeah. yeah yeah i just i do not know to what extent consciousness is involved in any of that like i don't super know how that shit works i'm just a meat bag yeah. But like, I know that my nutrients are going to be cycled and that does cause me a lot of like comfort. Oh, cool. And like makes me, I don't know, I just don't want my body to be like poisonous trash. You know? Right. No, no. <laughs> Which like, we're full of plastic. Like, yeah. But um, how would you like to be? What's your, what's your dream burial? I haven't really thought about it. I, ton yeah. because I definitely would not want to be like entombed. I would just want to go in the ground. I just <laughs> I just want to get eaten by bugs. Yeah. Like so, that is what I would prefer. So it's like to... the most direct nutrient cycling possible. Okay, yeah, no totally. <laughs> I understand that there are laws about that shit. And also, yeah. like, the people who I am leaving behind at that point would have needs as well. Yeah. And I would want to cater to those because those are just as important as cycling my nutrients. For sure, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's important. We're human beings, but we're really just organisms, part of the system full of organisms. Yeah. You know, and we have... We're going to get reintegrated. We're going to get reintegrated. <laughs> and our families are going to grieve because we are just, the, like, we respond to chemicals, we respond to stimuli, we, res you know, it just happens to be really complicated because humans have yeah. really complicated brains. Yeah. Oh, about the, <laughs> like, the, whether, like, the 
uh, sensory stuff has any spiritual involvement for me. I yeah. guess it's more, um, it just allows me to live in a slightly more magical realism state, ah. which is like, yes, on the same subject of never having really convinced myself that inanimate objects don't have feelings and in interior lives, yes, I have also never really been able to convince myself that if you just uh, lean into it the right way, maybe you could do some magic. Like it just seems like yeah. the universe's rules like are sometimes flexible for sure, and we don't super. I don't know. I just enjoy living in a more magical realistic state yeah and i don't think that necessarily conflicts with being grounded in existence and no. your body you know? no it doesn't because like our brains are fucking weird yes and like we can get stimuli that does not really correlate to the world that other people observe but Correct. none of us really know what we're fucking seeing no no all of, we're all <laughs> yeah. in these, like in little interior yeah, spaces we're all solipsis in bumper cars just like <laughs> solipsis in bumper cars <laughs> yeah just like trying to think about what other people's thoughts are yeah and it's real it's just something that literally no one has ever achieved no one has, no. no one has ever seen inside another person's brain fully like yes. no one has ever figured out what happens after you Die. die we not we have not and, like when i was a little kid it would have upset me that like god people y'all don't have answers to these questions like yeah. that's unprofessional we've been around that's here for like thousands of years <laughs> thought you guys would have priority <laughs> <laughs> come on people get it together please yeah yeah, yeah. i'm nine i want to know this by the time i'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> at this point it's the nutrient cycle is for you what is happening and that is enough for you. yeah like i'm sure that there are components of that act of reincarnation that I don't understand yeah. or I don't know how to conceptualize. For sure. Um, and that's fine. Yeah. I trust it. Yeah. Now the, uh, okay, so here's my other question. You talked about how nobody can see inside anybody else's brain, right? Is art an attempt to share your brain? Or to I like, think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I definitely find myself accidentally depicting dreamscapes. Ooh. like. Even if it like starts out in that direction, I'll incorporate things just like by feel and then look at them and be like, wow, this is really exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. like it'll sometimes things like evolve in directions I don't understand. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, this is a dream. Or like, oh, this is a subconscious state that I've been in. Yeah. And like, ah, let me show you an example. Yes, please. This one yeah. is I started constructing it with um, the back piece. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a, uh, a garden wall Ooh. with a big red door and yes. a bunch of flowers spilling over it. Yes. And in the, there are smaller boxes layered on top of it yep. that are in shades of gray mm -hmm. and, and, and lavender. And yeah. Because you really like lavender and gray together. My, um, the marker set I have right now has like six different shades of warm gray, green gray, blue gray, and cool gray. Oh, that's so and amazing. that shit is perfect. Like, give me the grays, <laughs> man. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> that's beautiful. So this is yeah. a dream escape? You were yeah. Saying? So Tell me about um, that. when I started drawing it, or when I started constructing the collage to yeah. draw it, um, I started with the back because I was like, oh, this reminds me of the blue house, which is uh, the house my mom grew up in. Oh, cool. Uh, it has like a very beautiful overgrown garden full of rhubarb Ooh. and uh, like blackberries and ferns and then I I wanted to like do a different color thing, so yeah. I did the whole background color and the whole foreground like shades of grayish, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, I just kind of picked random ones, but it ended up feeling exactly like my dream version of my grandma's house because I go there oh. constantly in yeah. my dreams. Like I I'm in Bellingham like every other night in my dreams for sure. And their house is always quilted on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's oh, just like about? being inside, like, a pill. Because their house is lined with crazy art stuff. Yeah. Like, it's yeah, just yeah. completely filled to the brims with, like, beautiful art ephemera from, like, decades and decades of male correspondence yeah. and crazy stuff. And That's one of my favorite things about you, and it's something that your Patreon Right? So if anybody's in the Patreon, they get a monthly mailing yeah. full of random ephemera. Because I fucking love mailing people art, and it's because of my grandparents. My yeah. grandpa um, had pen pals literally all around the world. Yeah. It was just constantly sending out rubber stamp scenes and like weird collage postcards. That's where I got my collaging from, is from my 
grandparents and my mom. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's like a family vocation. So the collaging is a family vocation, but you've brought, have brought your own spin and your yeah. own take on it. Yeah. I'm like the main, the main drawer of my family, I guess. Mm -hmm. Although my dad, he would always draw on our bills. Yeah. He would draw Muddy Mudskipper, which is like some Ooh. character he made. who's always like jumping on a stogie and shaking his fist and saying, why so high, Bills? Why so high, Bills? Bills, why so high? <laughs> He's um, actually gotten stamp carving material recently, and I think oh, he's going to make some stamps just like his drawings. Like Grandpa. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Well, Grandpa's stamps were all, I think they were mostly collected or like mm -hmm. commissioned from people. Cool. He didn't carve them, he just wielded them. Nice. He was really obsessed with like archaic, very unsafe forms of transportation. <laughs> There was this boat that he really loved that was like stuck in the port of Seattle for like days. If I remember right, it was called the Kalakala, and I was terrified of it as a child the because of other family experiences yeah. that made me terrified of giant machinery. The Kalakala, yeah. which is this boat that looks like a blimp. <laughs> it kind of looks like a giant AirPod trailer <laughs> mm -hmm. with like a bunch of like. It looks like the buses in Spongebob. It's okay. just a fucking cartoon of a piece of machinery. And like on its like inaugural mission, it got stuck in the mud and Weird. like just like tipped over and they had to evacuate. Him. So it's like, it's just like a giant mud slug in the middle of the port of Seattle. I think it got removed when I was in middle school and they were like really bummed. That's interesting that people like that's our boat that's stuck in the mud over there how long was it, it has like a cult following you could like go on it you could take tours of it like how long was it stuck in the mud for? i don't know i'm gonna look it up okay good so you grew up in, in that area so were you influenced by indigenous views of the world i definitely felt a lot of gravity towards views of the world in which more things are alive and given agency. Yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> given given your yeah. experience of things, that would be what you were into. Yeah. And I was super into that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I never, I, I hope I didn't ever take it in an appropriate way. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah. I definitely read a lot of mythology from mm -hmm. North America mm -hmm. and a bunch of history. And for a while in college, I was studying the pre-Columbian United States and immediate really 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 early colonialism for sure <laughs> like yeah. when well i mean you and i have also talked about utopianism yeah because both of us are into post-apocalyptic shit and future shit fundamentally living a modernly luxurious life yes is not feasible and it's not ethical right. like anyone who is doing that is doing it unethically yes. in my opinion yeah <laughs> like not saying that like you shouldn't be able to have a nice comfortable and safe filling life i'm not saying i'm just saying that maybe we need to have a big wealth cap you know yeah we need to stop having rich people okay we gotta stop <laughs> like i think that would do a really big step toward this is going to come up a lot fundamentally on this podcast I think. yeah yeah things would be so much more manageable if everyone else's lives besides the rich people were not catered, were not Ignored. completely taken up by having to cater to the rich. We like, do, all Like of us. everyone, I don't know, I just think that like, people think you have to be polite to rich people, fuck that. I agree. <laughs> well, I don't be polite to the ones who are polite to me. Like I'm not yeah. gonna treat, yeah. you know. But I mean like you don't have, someone is not inherently better than you are more powerful than you just, I mean they are more powerful. Well, maybe. <laughs> Societally. Eh, you know, what's power when In the whole world the is alive? Exactly. Right? Exactly. What is that kind of power when the whole world is alive? Rich people's value is not based in reality. No. It is not. And no. like we spend so much of our collective like energy and creativity and just straight up life juice trying to entertain the rich. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's backwards, right? If you if you could have your your ideal future what is your ideal future? I know that's a giant question, but I, what I see, I see so much hope in your art because there's so much aliveness to it, even aliveness to urban landscapes. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I don't think I, I don't living in a city or like built landscapes are yeah. antithetical to like, to life, to life. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Humans are animals. We're building yeah. things. Like fucking cities are natural environments. Yes. They are built by us. Yes. We are, <laughs> we are 
we evolved. We're building things. Like those are extensions of us. So so I just like, <laughs> so in the future we would have cities, but they would be more integrated into we would learn how to The thing that I want the most for us yes. is to be able to understand and respond to the world as it changes. Because like Earth is going to go through a lot of shit. Yes. And it's never stopped. Like, it just feels that way because our lives are like this. <laughs> and, right. Like, our lives are like little compressed seconds within the vast yeah. sort of framework of time. I know that there is going to be a gigantic species bottleneck. It's already happening. Yep. We're probably on only the very front end of it. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that human beings are able to grasp the situation and be resilient and yeah. flexible and figure out how to share with, with right. things that are not us because we literally well, and we just each have other. to recognize that we exist in ecosystems even when we're in our houses yes. and like I think that would change a lot no rich people and we need to realize that we are animals living in an ecosystem we no are, matter yeah. how many layers of plastic we encase ourselves in like, plastic or aluminum <laughs> or whatever else yeah yeah, yeah um, for sure like that's fine we can keep doing that but we're yeah. still going to be animals we're still <laughs> animals at the end of the day i just wish that we were capable of observing non-human members of our communities for sure yeah. <laughs> like, yeah in chicago right now we are late. Mm -hmm. there is a big crisis within uh street trees Yes. Because drought is really, really hard on them, very hard for them to get enough nutrients and space and deal with all of the stresses of living on a street yep. <laughs> already. And if your tree was your neighbor mm -hmm. and not treated like a piece of infrastructure, mm. I think that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And trees are alive. They're alive. They're around us and alive. And so they offer... That's very important to say because people yeah. fucking forget that plants are alive. Plants are alive! <laughs> well, and your you drawings... You have to teach children that plants are alive, but sometimes yeah. you have to teach adults I <laughs> bet. I bet, yeah. Yeah, so how do you teach a child that a plant is alive? It's, it's really hard because it's yeah. impossible to explain empathy. You yeah. just kind of have to show it. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. kind of how... <laughs> and, like, you have to be like, see, look, my friend over here... She's also nine, and she understands that plants are alive. Right. Maybe you guys could uh, be nice with this plant. <laughs> so, so maybe you could be like my friend over here who's nine years old and gets that plants are alive. Yeah, get, take, take, a, take a tip from Francine and fucking <laughs> figure out how to be nice. Follow Francine. Yeah. Yeah. Francine. Francine is the best. So was there a Francine, like, actually at the conservatory? Yeah. Okay, cool. She's the coolest. <laughs> She's the coolest. So what's so cool about kids? Their brains are awesome. <laughs> their brains, yes, their brains are awesome. Is I'm, it like the neuroplasticity or? I don't know. I just, I babysat for the first time recently since the pandemic. I mean, like within the pandemic, not saying. Yes. <laughs> since, like, yes. since it began. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not since it. Because it, it's yeah. not gone. <laughs> I had completely forgotten that in a lot of ways, I feel so much more comfortable talking to a child than an adult. Like when mm. it comes to like, kids I don't know versus adults I don't know. Yeah. The kids, any day. I could totally talk to a child I don't know, but an adult I don't know, I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> what am I going to do? It's wow, just a total totally crapshoot. Like, I feel like my brain is just like, let's roll the dice. Are we going to be really friendly and funny? Are we going to be a total freak? Yeah, right? <laughs> like, right? Yeah, for sure. I just find communicating with kids to be very good for my brain yeah and like just to be really fun and relaxing yeah and because they're so random i just really appreciate their method of existence and yeah. what what it brings to their what they deem as an important thing to tell me like i'm always just like thank you for these gifts yes. that you are giving me of this weird sentence or like you gave me a new name cool well, this or, new like, name Aaron. Aaron. I don't know where that came with from. With an AA or with an E? You don't I don't know. He's four, so. Oh, okay. He wouldn't know. He doesn't know the difference. So it's just Aaron. It's just Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Aaron. Be a uh, non binariness. What's up with that? When did you come out? What's going on? How do you understand gender? Oh, uh, yeah. I started going by jam full time when I moved to Chicago like four years ago. Okay, four years ago. So 2015? No, that's not four years ago. That's 17. like six years ago. 2017. Also, it's the future. <laughs> it is the future right now. But I came out I, kind of slowly. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people knew 
mm -hmm. before I knew. Yeah. Like my parents knew before I told them. Yeah. I was going to come out to them eventually and we were having a conversation over the phone and my mom was like, oh, sorry. I just realized I was using a lot of she pronouns on you, man. My bad. And I was like, oh. what? <laughs> good, good job, mom. Hey, <laughs> like, I mommy. just like started crying. I was oh, like, oh my God. <laughs> you just like, I, I literally didn't tell them. Yeah. They might've picked it up from my friends or like just from talking to me. Yeah. They just made that switch without me having to say anything. And then I was noted that I was like, I noticed that you had figured this out I was going to tell you they were like oh yeah we got you yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I like that they figured it out first and we're just let's chill we don't need to do anything about this this is I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, that's insane and yes. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't like very strong about preferring they, them pronouns. Until people really started using them and then I was, oh yeah, this is great. I want, I, I yeah. do want this. <laughs> you know, that happened to me as well. Like it, it's happened at work really. Like it's the first place that I've insisted on they, yeah. them pronouns. And it is, once it's, once they start using once them. Once it's consistent. Once it's consistent and people are doing it, you're like, hell yeah, this is but, what I need. And this it's is my me is is a way to show yourself like oh yeah. this is a valid thing for me to ask of my people around me. right like this is this is a valid request because there's a lot of like oh like that's too hard for everybody it's like oh, it's not, why, super not. <laughs> why are why are you with a then because i do feel more intimidated by uh like z's or pronouns yeah. i don't feel as much uh i don't practice them as much yeah. and i know other people also have not practiced them as much For so sure. i just i guess part of it is so my brain being like this is an easier ask like if there was a there, if there was a better non-binary pronoun that everybody i guess part of my brain is still trying to cater to making it consistent for other people right which isn't necessarily the best reason to or go with consistent the for cis people exactly hmm. like that's but i also like we all do it yeah <laughs> you have to survive because with the cis people it's like you gotta yeah i guess my brain is just like oh there are so many battles to fight about this yeah like, there's so many conversations you're going to have to have already right like you might as well cut down on it a little bit with this yeah, yeah and yeah. like that's i really admire people who are able to do all that work all the time and yeah. like i want to support them and like you use the pronouns that they want exactly exactly so how do you how do you understand your gender uh, i can't tell if it's a hard neither or a hard folk I, yeah i just truly can't uh, talking to kids about it actually has helped me figure it out more. Because yeah. they'll like ask me questions like that that adults will not ask me. Right, <laughs> right. Because adults are too scared or they don't want to offend you. And kids. And like trying to explain it to a kid is also trying to like explain it and work through it myself yeah. in a way that is more gentle and not entirely in my brain. I wouldn't explain when I'm explaining how I work to a kid, I'm a lot more loving towards myself and gentle towards myself mm. because I want to be gentle towards this kid as well. So, so looking at myself that way yeah. and like trying to answer their questions, it just puts me in a better place to think about those things, I guess. So in the process... I'm like, oh, they're not trying to hurt me. I shouldn't try and hurt me either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, how about we just be gentle yeah. and compassionate towards one another? It was about that compassion piece, right? That kids are are just kind of like more naturally compassionate or more naturally able to not necessarily like you do need to teach some you sometimes you do need to teach empathy yeah and like that is very challenging <laughs> i bet yeah but it's doable it's not like if you i guess i feel more like non-binary makes sense to me because very literally just existing outside of the, the not one or the other right and i'm not sure if i'm something else yeah or if I'm a mix, or if I'm, I'm definitely not a void though, you know? Yeah. No, like I've got either. some gender, I just don't really, it's just there. <laughs> it's, it's there, you're, you're in it, Yeah. you know? We're all in our gender all the time. So you don't have an answer to what, what your gender is. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I, I kind of feel like I don't really need to define it. Like I've also right. felt that way about my sexuality, like I used yeah. to, identify as pan mm -hmm. and now i'm just like i don't really even know if it matters for me to articulate a category of human that i'm attracted to it just feels weird now <laughs> no yeah it's, it's more about the 
like the am I, individual human that you're attracted to, not necessarily yeah. a kind of human. Like it's really, <laughs> it's hard to define your sexuality by your gender and the people you're attracted to's gender when you're non-binary. <laughs> it is. Like, am I yes. gay because I'm mostly attracted to non-binary people? Am mm -hmm. I bisexual because I'm sometimes attracted to dudes? Yep. Like, yep. Yep. I am sometimes attracted to ladies. Am I pan? I, I, it just, it's, it's just, I don't find it to be a useful categorization. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, also, like, like, why I spend the time on it, yeah. sort of? Yeah. I feel like being poly is a much more purposeful, actual factor in how I have relationships than what gender I'm attracted to. Ah. Like, I feel like that being non hierarchically poly yeah. is. It's just like more, more, more of a of relevant detail. Yeah. Like it seems more important than. <laughs> why is that? Why is that more relevant to you? Like, what is it about non-hierarchical polyamory that that works so well for you? You can't expect one person to meet all of your needs, and you can't expect yourself to meet the entirety of another human being's needs. Right. Like it's just. And ultimately, we are <laughs> we are responsible for our own needs. Yeah, yeah. and it's just monogamy is so mandatory that oh, you yeah. don't really even I don't know because all depictions of polyamory that I got as a child were not polyamory they were like ah oh, people cheating right? yeah like, yeah and I was like oh man so I guess it's morally wrong to be attracted to more than one, one person, person at a time or like it's morally <laughs> wrong to like I just have a lot of love and I want to I just want to share I just totally. wanted to the <laughs> there's also something about non-hierarchical uh, polyamory where we value our friendships yeah right? yeah it's like, made me a better friend it does because like, like you and I like we are just like really good friends and we spend time together as friends and yeah. it's important for us to have that time. Also, yeah. the reason that I think non-hierarchical relationships are important in general, like not just romantically, mm -hmm. is because every relationship I have with a different person is different. Like they are not comparable. No. Like they're not rankable. Yeah. They're not the, they're not the same in any way that makes them comparable. For like, sure. Right now, I'm only dating one person, but yeah. when I was dating two people, I could not really, like, imagine having one of them be my primary partner. Yeah. Like, it just didn't, it just doesn't make sense right. for how I feel about them. Yeah. Those two relationships were totally different. Yeah. <laughs> like, completely right. different. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And and also, like, the sense of you are your primary you're a primary to yourself and then the relationships that you choose to bring into your life it is a choice it's not yeah. it's not a compulsion it's not a you know something you need to do to feel whole why did we eat tacos today oh i thought you were regretting it no no not at all. no i'm just asking <laughs> I was you like, oh no <laughs> <laughs> no they were very good i'm asking why why tacos why vegetarian tacos I uh, just never really liked meat that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, factory farming is horrible. Yeah, it is. I guess I can give up this thing I didn't like that much. <laughs> That's and I, I've uh, had a challenging time nourishing myself over the pandemic. And yep. I have found that just having a giant melange of veggies yep. uh, wrapped up in some kind of carb uh, with lots of good sauce yep. is a... Uh, sauce. The most consistent way I can make myself eat food. <laughs> I, <you laughs> or, know, like, get myself excited to eat food. Yes. And the food was exciting. And it's it, it sizzles. It smells good when you're making it. The yep. plantains are a nice treat. The plantains were great. It just makes... And I like making colorful food. We mm. had, like, red peppers yep. and red onion mm -hmm. and uh, spinach. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and even the hot sauce was like a really nice orangey color. Yeah. Yeah. So I like I like having colorful meals. Mm -hmm. So you like making collage with your food. Yeah. Awesome. And it's it's a thing that I feel confident about making for other people. Because yes. there are some things that I make for myself that I'm like, I don't think anyone else would want to eat. Mm -hmm. Salsa, beans, and mashed up cornbread in a bowl. <laughs> Possibly not. <laughs> but it was good for you. I prefer Weird fact about me, I would rather eat crumbled up cornbread than rice with my beans. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so just cornbread, or can there be jalapeno in it? Or yeah. I like making stuffed jiffy cornbread. Nice. So like I get, I recently found out that they had a vegetarian option for the cornbread, which made what? me go, I guess I ate a lot of bones. Hey! 
<laughs> but um, so I like make the mix cornbread, but I put in garlic and onions yep. and spinach and cilantro and uh, green onions and uh, whatever else I can find yes. that is cookable. Because <laughs> nourishing yourself to stay alive is important in a world that is alive. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just a little dog who has to trick myself to eat vegetables by baking them into big big bread hunks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> however you can eat those vegetables, yeah. it's really important. I'm like, I probably need more iron. <laughs> But, um, yeah, and they're fun to make with people because yeah. there are tasks to do. Indeed. You know, like, thank you for doing a bunch of chopping. I love cutting vegetables. It's, like, one of my favorite things to do. It's so, like, meditative to just be, now I am cutting this way, and now I am cutting this way. So I enjoy yeah. it. I have a lot of hand. <laughs> Often I will uh, draw until my hands feel really fucked up. <laughs> I would imagine, yes. yes. <laughs> and then, like, chopping stuff is just, like, aggravating to my, like, these guys. So sometimes that also keeps me from wanting to cook food. <laughs> Occupational hazard of the uh, of the artist, I suppose. Yeah. Stippling and chopping are not compatible activities to do for long periods of time. <laughs> no stippling and cutting. Oh, you, you, so you, Jam, you did my icon for my podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. And um, and I told you to draw a tardigrade that was in the style of Hildegard of Bingen and Albert of Durer, and you really did that. That's one of my, I don't know, like the premise you came to me with like, yeah. just resonated with me so much because yeah. we're both like super into like weird old Christianity. Yep. We're both super into tardigrades yep. and like saintly iconography. I was yes. just like this. Yeah, it was really fun to make. I am very proud of it and glad that I could pro it's I, I find it to be an honor to provide you with a sigil that like represents you. Me. Yeah. Like yeah, for sure. When people ask me to make things that like represent themselves, it is very meaningful because like I have a hard sh time doing that shit about myself. Like, right. Well, it's I feel like, like all of your, all I'm getting of your... some like self reflection vicariously. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, that's the thing. Is like I feel like all of your art is expressing you. Like you are in your art, um, and your expression and your your personality and your your unique sense of the world is very much present in your art. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to affirm that for you. So uh, let's wrap up by you telling people where they can find your art and how they can purchase it and give you money. Sweet. All right. Uh, <laughs> I am trying to get more people on my Patreon because I love Patreon. sending mail. Mail. Um, you get free mail. Yeah. yeah. At the $5 tier, I send you a zine every month. At like 15 I send you a zine. Two postcards and three stickers. Just Whoa. kidding. I actually send you a lot more, but you that's can, what it says on my page. You get tons of stuff. Like, Jan has sent me mail, and like, I literally like open the thing, and just stickers fly everywhere. It's beautiful. It's you gotta like, if if I'm like sending an envelope and it only has one thing in it, it yeah. makes me sad. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta really get more. Like, like it's going there anyways. Yeah. I might as well like pack it full of cool stuff. Like, yeah. And it's um, like cooking for someone, really. Like you're putting together a, a recipe, sort of your own yeah. special tastes. And like, so. I like that. Um, what I've heard back from some people who are on my Patreon is like that they enjoy using all of the postcards. Or like my friend Meg, they really like coloring the postcards. Mm -hmm. So I send them black and white ones that they can color. Nice. Um, like if you have like personalizations for like what kinds of stuff you want, I will totally do that. Yeah. And um, the I also have a. $30 level Ooh, where you get a print as well as everything else. $30. Actually, you know, $30 a month is not very much money, frankly. And it, it really helps. It would really help <laughs> It would be really, be like, I, right now I have 11 patrons and they are awesome. Yes. And I'm really, really pumped about it. Yes. And I would love to be able to cover rent with Patreon. Right. <laughs> like, that would be my dream. And if that takes oh. me years, then it's okay. Okay. But, but covering rent with Patreon is like a perfectly reasonable job. That's my goal. Artist. I think that's great. <laughs> that's great. And how many how many patrons do you really need for that? Not too many. I think you could do it. Yeah. And also, like, um, Instagram is another place people can follow you as well. Correct? Yes. And, uh, and wormy Orchids. Wormy Orchids. And Etsy is also Wormy Orchids. Etsy is Wormy Orchids Art. I maybe should change it okay. so that it's consistent. Because wormy I don't think anyone art. else 
uses wormy orchids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we never talked about why you use wormy orchids. So what's up with that? Do you just like worms and orchids? What's going on? Basically, yeah, okay. I, I thought of it while I was weeding in the cloud forest in oh. uh, this uh, weird orchid garden oh. in, uh, in Peru. Oh. When I studied abroad there. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And um, orchid roots are like very wormy as well. Uh -huh. And so I just, they're both images that I really like depicting as like crawly, like succulent flower flesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and I just liked that vibe. And crawling so succulent. I used that. Oh, man, that's pretty good. Crawling succulent. <laughs> flower flesh <laughs> that's what really gets me those etsy views for people trying to decorate their comfy cozy homes they're like ah yeah i would love some succulent flower flesh flower flesh for oh. my for my hovel um i think i mean like i personally have a bunch of your art because so i think everybody should get some flower flesh <laughs> up in their biz and like the the whole like your your work just is vibrant and it vibrates like it's so resonant and i think like Everybody needs to see it. So, Wormy Orchids, everybody. Um, GM, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Yeah, thank you for thank you for being my friend. Thank <laughs> you for being my friend. For being my friends. Friend. You ask uh, great questions that like help me think about things from different angles. Cool. Even though I spend a lot of time with self-expression, I struggle with reflecting on it, really interpreting what it means about what my brain is doing or yeah. like, why I feel compelled to create these things. Yeah. And I think thinking about those things will help me feel making artists a more valid experience. I agree. <laughs> or like a valid thing for me to be doing. Appreciate that angle. Yeah. I mean, like, it's important to validate your own work uh, because it is important because it's it's your expression to the world. It's you you communicating your brain. People deserve to see that vision. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, friend. I love you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Love you too, friends. Love, I love you. <laughs> I love you guys too. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much for joining Jam and I for tacos this week. Jam's art can be found in person in Chicago if you go to Wolf Bait, Space Oddities, or Quimby's Bookstore. My name is Saint Sparkleware, and I edit and write this podcast. The theme song is by Gail Gallagher. And my logo is created by Jim Doty and adapted by Wesley Morris Sloat. This podcast is produced by New Faith New Media Network. You can find them online at Facebook or on Patreon at www.patreon.com backslash NFNM. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great week.